Hello, um, my name is Magdalena. I'm working like my colleague Francesco Sardi. I'm working at ISA in Estrin in Italy. Um, so I got this presentation today. So if uh, something goes wrong, I'm already sorry. Um, I'm working in Estrin as a remote sensing project scientist. So I'm involved in all the projects uh, related to remote sensing, Earth observation, mostly using radar data. And that's why also Francesco asked me to do this presentation because there is a, a large part about this topic here. So um, we are going to talk about the space-based data or space-based methods uh, for plate tectonics applications. So, okay, I will skip this outline. <clears throat> this one is not very interesting after the presentation of my colleague here. This is not very... But I will not uh, ask you to jump or move. Or... So anyway, we, we all know that these <clears throat> tectonic plates are not fixed. They are, they are moving. They are dynamic. The boundaries of the, of the, um, of the plates are changing. They are moving, uh, not connected to each other. So as we, can, uh, as we know, as we can suppose, all these movements and uh, especially at the boundaries uh, the, where, where the plates are touching each other, it can cause some uh, effects like earthquakes, volcanoes, eruptions, etc. So how do we observe these phenomena? Uh, so we can observe these phenomena from Earth observation, so from remote sensing, anything which is not the in-situ data, but anything remote. So we can start from drones, uh, balloons, uh, uh, going higher and higher, airplanes, and uh, finally, satellites. So um, I have to read maybe something to see. Um, so we see that air observation from space, also the airborne imagery, uh, can provide sometimes new insight. Sometimes we see the things that we won't see uh, making the in-situ measurements. And we can, because of that, also understand better and model the Earth's crust. Uh, we can also identify features um, on different scales, from the really regional scales to uh, local scales to regional scales, even the global scale. So one of the methods, one of the techniques that we can use to, um, to monitor or to, to detect or to um, yeah, the, basically monitor the, uh, the tectonics is uh, Earth observation data uh, acquired from the satellites. So now, um, maybe some of you heard about this. Uh, ESA, together with the Co European Commission, uh, we've launched um, some satellites. Not some, for now it's some because it's just five, but there are 20 other um, missions to come. So. These first two are of our interest today. Uh, Sentinel-1, which is the SAR mission. Where's the pointer? Okay. So Sentinel-1 is the SAR mission, so radar mission. The best asset of radar mission is that it works um, even in the day daylight and night, and it's not dependent on the weather conditions. So this is a very good asset. However, processing of the data is quite, it's more difficult than optical data because it's not very natural for us as people uh, to, to look, look at these images. Um, then we have, to, or to interpret these images. Then we have Sentinel-2, so this is the optical high resolution land mission. Um, so these two um, missions possibly can help us to derive some information about the, uh, about the tectonics. There are also other missions. This is the medium resolution land and ocean mission, Sentinel-3. Then we have Sentinel-4 and Sentinel-5. Um, so Sentinel-1 mission, uh, for the moment we have two satellites, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-1A and uh, Sentinel-1B. One was launched in 2014, the other in 2016. The purpose of this satellite is to, uh, the applications, the main applications are to, uh, for ice and uh, land monitoring, marine monitoring, and mapping for the support of, uh, in ca case of the uh, humanitarian crisis. So the main features of these satellites are that they are working in a C-band. 
So satellite can work in different wavelengths. This one is with the C-band. We have daily coverage uh, for the high priority areas. Um, <coughs> sorry. We had a 12 days repeat cycle with one satellite. And because we launched the other satellite on the same orbit, basically what we can have now is the repeat cycle of six days, which is quite cool. If you think that before we had 35 days. So you see that this is a bit um, game changer. Um, the satellite is designed for seven years, but it has uh, enough uh, power supply for 12 years. But there are also other Sentinel-1 missions, next letters, uh, to come uh, in the future. So there are a few um, different modes in which you can obtain the images. It depends on for what purpose you want. There are different resolutions for each mode, and there are different polarization, different uh, swath width, which means that the area that the satellite is uh, is going is um, able to acquire over um, the area over which the satellite is uh, able to acquire the image. So either you have a really uh, small stripe or you have a large area, but then the resolution is changing. So it depends on your application if you want better resolution or high coverage, and so on. So this is uh, okay. Just an example how. This is the satellite, nice uh, visualization. And you see it obtains images in kind of uh, three um, paths, called swaths, sub-swaths. And okay, it's switching from one to another. This is the way of, uh, of uh, acquiring data. They are different for different satellites. So some satellites have the same uh, style of uh, data acquisition, but there are also, um, the, the modern one are usually like that, but they are also different. So the other uh, technique, technology that we are using, we can use and we are all using, um, is the Global Navigation Satellite System, GNSS. So um, most of you probably know GPS, everybody knows GPS. Uh, this is one of the global navigation satellite systems, the American one. Uh, so how it works, we have uh, uh, many, many satellites uh, around the Earth sending the signals, and we have uh, receivers on the Earth receiving the signal from space. And based on these, uh, um, the measurements, uh, we can define our position. Uh, so there are, at the moment, we have four GNSS systems. One is the GPS, then we have European Galileo, we have Russian GLONASS, and we have Chinese Compass. Now I have a very nice video about the Galileo and uh, also differences between uh, different systems. Satellite positioning has become a vital part of our everyday lives and is key for farming, science, precise timing and emergency response. We use it in our phones, cars, planes, trains, ships and thousands of other applications. Initially it was powered by an American system, GPS or Global Positioning System. A few years later a Russian system, GLONASS, was introduced. In 2016, Galileo, the European Global Navigation System, launched its initial services. So what is Galileo and what makes it different from other constellations? Galileo is a European state-of-the-art system that provides highly accurate, guaranteed global positioning and super precise timing. Once fully deployed, Galileo will consist of 24 operational satellites and six in-orbit spares, 23,000 kilometers above the Earth, supported by a range of terrestrial sensor stations and control centers around the world. Galileo is autonomous, but also interoperable with existing satellite navigation systems and many devices combine two or three constellations to increase accuracy and reliability. While it can work with other systems, Galileo is unique. First of all, it's European and under civilian control. All other systems are operated by the military, 
So it provides Europe and European citizens with independence and sovereignty. Galileo also provides a range of new services, including search and rescue, PRS, a secure service for government applications and a more precise positioning for commercial applications. By offering dual frequencies as standard, Galileo will in fact deliver new levels of real-time positioning accuracy and substantially improve availability of the service under the most extreme circumstances. By deploying Galileo, Europe also minimizes the risk of other navigation systems being switched off or degraded. Galileo is the result of unprecedented European cooperation and innovation to offer people across the globe a new, reliable, independent civilian navigation and timing system that will power limitless applications. So you see, Europe is not sleeping. Um, so, okay, uh, we have the Global Navigation Satellite Systems, which is, uh, thanks to which we are able to define position on the Earth. So, how does it relate to our tectonics? Let's go to the next slide. So, um, these are just examples of uh, receivers uh, that are receiving the, the signal from, from this uh, constellation of satellites from the really basic uh, receivers with meter accuracy or centimeter accuracy to millimeter accuracy uh, with the professional geodetic uh, receivers. So, um, what kind of um, measurements we can perform uh, using GNSS? There are two types of uh, measurements, and there are static measurements and kinematic measurements. So, kinematic measurements basically uh, would serve us if you want to, I don't know, make a survey to, to measure, maybe for geodesists, for example. You want to uh, measure the, where you have to build a house and so on. Static measurements, uh, on the other hand, can serve us as a nice reference and uh, for the tectonics, for the movements of the tectonic plates to see what is going on on the Earth, to see if something is, uh, there is a uplift, downlift, there are some movements. We can all see these things with the, with the static GNSS measurements. This is just a website. Um, when you get this presentation, you can just relate to this website if you want more information about the, about the system. So, in general, this method, GNSS, it's very good, it's super precise. There is only one slight problem. We are measuring everything point-wise. We are not seeing the full view. We are only measuring in certain points, which is also not very easy because to have this static um, measurements, static um, receivers, you have to maintain them, you have to take care of, of them. So this is not, it's really precise, very good method, but it, to work as itself only one, uh, maybe it's not enough. So um, now what we are, what we will, I will show you is uh, a synergy. So GNSS plus Earth observation data and what we can do uh, with this couple. So um, what we have here, uh, we have, okay, with the um, space that data rec now, recently, we can, only, why recently, I will tell you in a while, we can allow mapping and measuring small scale uh, deformation over large areas with high special resolution, yes. And we can, thanks to this, understand the model um, active tectonics. Why I said recently, because this is the last 10 years before, uh, we didn't have so many Earth observation missions focused on this topic. And we were not able, we didn't have the availability of the data, so it was not so easy. Now, with um, not only Sentinels, but also other, um, other uh, missions, satellite missions, you can, we have really enormous number of data. Now we have another problem, how to store it and how to process it, but okay. At least we have data, something that we were crying for maybe uh, 50 years. So, um, very recently, in 2018, the European Commission granted the, the legal uh, status for, of the European Research Infrastructure Consortium to EPOS. 
So EPOS is the European Plate Observing System. And now I want to show you another short video about EPOS itself. Maybe we will not play fully, but okay. Earth is a geologically active planet. Its internal structure constantly brings about morphological changes to its surface. Tectonic plate movements constitute the most evident manifestation of this dynamism. As with all areas of our planet, the European tectonic plate is acted upon by naturally occurring phenomena, determining the vulnerability of the anthropic environment. Europe hosts a high population density and likewise a dense production network. Understanding how the Earth works as a system is critically important to modern society that needs resources to support daily life and security in the face of natural hazards. Earth sciences can provide the answers to maintain the Earth as a habitable, safe, and prosperous planet. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, floods, tsunamis are manifestations of Earth's natural dynamics. What makes them catastrophic is how they impact human society. Indeed, only anthropic environments can be impacted by, so to speak, natural disasters. Earth sciences collect data and observations thanks to which we can understand these phenomena and assess the threats they may pose to society. Observing systems used to monitor geological phenomena on the Earth's surface or from space provide data for scientific research. Through research, we understand, forecast, and mitigate the hazards posed by Earth's dynamism. The research infrastructures for Earth sciences include monitoring networks, experimental laboratories, and data centers, collecting an enormous quantity of heterogeneous multidisciplinary data, and supercomputers generating novel scientific products. By their very nature, Disasters cross national boundaries and the data they generate do not regard just one field of research. Therefore, the task of understanding complex geological phenomena requires collection and integration of multidisciplinary data gathered by means of complex technologies and dedicated services. EPOS was founded as a response to this. EPOS is the pan-European infrastructure for sharing solid Earth science data, observations, and research results. With its innovative IT platform, EPOS enables sharing and integration of data collected by the research infrastructures of 25 Euro-Mediterranean area countries. EPOS architecture is designed for sustainability, providing services to scientists, national authorities, and society at large. EPOS enables interdisciplinary and transnational use of data, thus broadening out the horizons of research and technological progress, while fostering widespread awareness of issues relating to sustainable, responsible use of environments. Each scientific community shall ensure the expertise and resources required not only for collecting and analyzing data, but also for maintaining territorial observation systems. The, uh, EPOS thematic course. Okay, so you see that this is, we have many projects which are dealing with this topic, but this is the uh, currently the most important and uh, you see that it's not only the measurements and there's a network of scientists and, and all the infrastructure which is helping us to understand uh, the dynamics of the Earth. So um, what we can do with, um, with the GNSS also and also with, um, but mostly with Earth observation data is to map different geomorphological and topographical features so mountains, valleys, rifts, uh, which are on the, on the earth. So uh, this can be done with the satellite data that we are, we are acquiring. Basically, the, the most useful in this case uh, for, for this purpose is the synthetic aperture radar, so SAR missions, and or optical, because optical data are sometimes also used for some uh, purposes, I will mention later on. So they are very powerful tools for, for surface and also deep geological and tectonic structure detection. 
So here, you see uh, just an image. There are some mountains, there is a valley. Um, this is something that we could obtain from the um, plane. That's the aerial photography. So geologists uh, can already know, looking at these structures, they know what, are the, what is the geological background of these structures, right? Um, but if we have a nice image from the space, we can see even more. We can see, first of all, a larger area. We can see the bigger, um, bigger uh, picture of this, uh, of this place. And based on, for example, in this case is the uh, radar image, we can um, delineate here some folds, some boundaries between different geological structures as well. This is another, uh, another example. This is for um, the change detection. So not only, we cannot only map the current situation. We can also see the changes. Why? Because we have a lot of data, we have the, which are acquired um, in a regular ba on a regular basis. So we can also map the changes. And this is something, okay, uh, it's, it's not the radar image, it's, uh, it's um, a map derived from GOCHA satellite, it's another ESA satellite, a gravity satellite, which is showing the, uh, it's the map of um, the discontinuity between mantle and, and crust, it's a moho, right? Um, so uh, just to show you that it can also be done. So not only the, the features which are on the ground, but also something which is really deep in the, uh, under, under, the, under the surface. Uh, to map the um, structures, the geological structures, to map the, um, the Earth's surface, we can also use um, stereo optical data and also simultaneous radar acquisition, which allow us to derive digital, uh, digital elevation models. So uh, this we have now globally. Um, so this is an example of, um, there are two satellites, German satellites, and Terrasarix and Tandemix. They are creating a tandem, which is simultaneously uh, acquiring data over the same area. They are really in a small distance, and the orbits are in a small distance, the satellites are on, uh, in the small distance between each other. <coughs> so in between the acquisition, there is no change. Right, so we can acquire two radar images, and then using a technique which is called SAR interferometry, we can derive digital elevation model. This is the interferometric uh, phase. So if you have two uh, radar images where we record phase of the signal, which is coming back from the from the Earth, we can uh, just subtract this phase and receive this kind of really nice and colorful fringes, uh, which are uh, then, we, we can interpret it and we can, we can basically derive the topography. So this is an example of um, digital elevation model from uh, this Tandem X mission. And just to, um, just for your knowledge that we have it, uh, you can also do mosaic of this uh, digital elevation model and we can have the global digital elevation model really with the uh, centimeter precision, which is really amazing. Um, for this geological uh, surveys, geological um, uh, sciences, what is also important is the thing that we see on the ground. Sometimes you have different land covers which are related to different, um, different soil types which are related to some geological structures we have, which we have on the, on the ground. So um, we can also use optical data to derive land cover. Um, so we can classify the land cover uh, and map also soil properties, including minerals, uh, which will happen soon with a new hyperspectral emission that we have uh, coming in, in we will, they will come in uh, next years. So this is just an example of land cover from Korean land cover, 2006. Okay, just to give you an imagination that we can do it globally. It's not uh, local. We can do it globally in the regional scale as well. 
So GNSS and SAR interferometry allow us to measure accurately ground displacement. So since many years we have this GNSS, very precise displacement measurements, but what I've said before already, this is the data in, punk, uh, in uh, points, it's uh, point-wise data. We don't have, we didn't have the, the, the large view. So, okay, this is just an example. You see, this is a very difficult job to maintain, to measure. Uh, since uh, 1991, uh, when ESA launched the first uh, ERS-1 uh, satellite, followed by ERS-2, these were the first uh, radar satellite run, uh, launched by ESA, the information that we have from GNSS could be enriched and complemented with this SAR interferometry, what we said before. So we can, thanks to INSAR, SAR interferometry, we can compute the maps of ground displacement over large regions, and now, with current system that we have, we can have few centimeter or even millimeter um, accuracy. So imagine, from the space, we can have millimeter accuracy in measuring displacements. Amazing. So this is an, just an example of an abandoned area in uh, Greece. Uh, there was a, a land subsidence there, and okay, there is some groundwater coming and okay, this was abandoned just to show you that this kind of areas, uh, even almost in the center of Thessaloniki, you can, you can find. And this is the part of a study done by our colleagues from Greece. Uh, on the right side here, and I think there is a zoom, and this is displacement uh, that they measured from GNSS stations. So you see, we have these stations here, um, this is about, what, five millimeters per year, just to show you the scale. Um, but you see that, okay, we have this displacement, it's very nice, but it's still uh, just in these places where we have stations. On the other hand, using SAR interferometry, if we have, this is a derived method from the SAR interferometry called the persistent scatterers interferometry, where we are using a large stack of um, radar images, 40, 60, 80, whatever, a lot, we can derive this kind of product, which is basically showing you, you see, we ha you have displacement in each of these points. So this is, if we compare to the previous image, we see that there is a large improvement. And accuracy is, uh, it's, it's not much worse, or even the same. So uh, currently with this new generation of satellites, Sentinel-1, A and B, and this revisit time that we have of six days, um, as we, I said before already, uh, they, the temporal resolution has gone from uh, 35 days to six days, and also the area that we are mapping before was 100 kilometers. Now, in one pass of the satellite, it's 250 kilometers. So of course you you know now that uh, in shorter time you can you can uh, make global uh, acquisitions. Um, okay, and there are also I'm mentioning here mostly Sentinel One because this is ESA mission, but uh, there are also of course other uh, satellite um, radar satellites from Canada, Japan, uh, Italy, Germany, and so on. So, okay, this displacement accuracy uh, is dependent on the wavelength that we are using. Uh, so we can, there are some satellites which are using X-band, like Terrasar X, and Sentinel-1, as I said, is the C-band. So depending on the accuracy that you want to receive, you would probably choose different, uh, different type of um, sensor, however, really a big asset of Sentinel-1 is that the data are free. Data are free and acquired over um, tempo, um, regularly. So all these displacements that we can map with radar images are along a line of sight because radar is looking on, uh, on left or right side, depends on the system. So it's not like optical systems that are uh, looking in nadir below the satellite, it's always side looking. So all the displacement that we will see, I will show you in a, in a while, they are a line of sight. So displacement in the line of sight of, uh, of the satellite. 
And this technique in SAR can mainly reveal the vertical component, so uplift of subsidence. So this is an example of this nice uh, insert again the fringes. So each fringe, so one cycle of the colors, is a, a half of the, the displacement, which is a half of the wavelength. So if the wavelength is say three centimeters, so one cycle would be uh, one and a half centimeter of the displacement, always in the line of sight. So this is a very nice technology, it's not new, but now it's used operationally. For many, many years it was a bit of experiment and scientific method. Now it's used operationally, so it's, uh, it's, it's, not, um, well, it's, it's now known as a method for monitoring displacement. So, okay, here you see that farther we are going, this is the fault. And the farther that we are going from the uh, from the uh, fold, we can okay we can easily recognize these fringes. We can count them. We can um, we can calculate displacement. Close to the fold, displacement is too big. The damage is too big, and we cannot do it. We cannot uh, have this phase measurement. We cannot see the displacement. So there are other techniques. There are other techniques, like um, also using radar, uh, radar correlation, to see this kind of feature. So for example, here you see that there is a blind fault, so some rupture, uh, which is related to the BAM earthquake in 2003. Um, this is called blind because you cannot see it very clearly at the surface, uh, but we were able to detect it with uh, SAR images. So this is this technology, this technology, this um, the method of processing, let's say, of uh, of radar data. So here, this is the the main fault. So as you see, this um, radar technology is giving us a lot of information about uh, not only displacement but also about the mechanism of uh, of of the, this uh, dynamic processes. So um, what we can improve uh, now, we have a large temporal series. And we can, with this large temporal series of uh, images acquisitions, we can not only measure the co-seismic uh, deformation, or, but also the small inter-seismic deformation. Because before it was basically like that, that if we had an earthquake, we had one image maybe 20 days before, and one image we had to wait because we already knew that there is an earthquake, or we were acquiring the uh, programming, the satellite to acquire the data. Now, because we have the regular acquisitions, basically we can observe everything within the years. So not only the events, but also the, the movements which are in between the events. So, um, okay, there is, uh, there is another movie. I think we can, we can skip it because I don't know how much time we have, but uh, there is, uh, when you get this presentation, you can just play this, uh, this movie. So this is the same technique, again, multi-temporal in SAR, and that the scientists were able to detect surface displacement uh, and, and monitor the East African Rift, and they revealed that uh, this Mount Longonot in Kenya has grown uh, nine centimeters. So you can see later on the, this nice uh, video. So this um, rise and growth of the mountains also can be caused, of course, by, by the uh, volcanic um, activity. So we have magma underground and maybe it can, uh, it can cause also some deformation on the ground. Okay, this is another example. We will skip that. So uh, this different information that we obtain can serve and can be assimilated into seismic and tectonic uh, models, which are helping scientists to understand better the entire uh, earthquake cycle, and also somehow uh, estimate the probability of future, uh, future events. The same is with volcanoes. I will show you um, here. So you see that and there are these um, phenomena related to um, the magmatic chambers of the volcanoes, 
where there is a, a bit of pressure uh, in these uh, magma chambers, then you can see the uplift, small uplift of the ground uh, surface. So of course, be, before we had these technologies, it was impossible to, to derive this kind of information. This is an example from um, 1992 to 2001, displacement of Etna Vulcano. So you can see, it's uh, the, the, as you see, the red one is up to 14 centimeters. So we know, okay, Etna, because it's, uh, it's still active Vulcano, but there are many tectonic areas all over the world including uh, uh, the place that I live close to, so the Campi Flagrei uh, in Naples, in Italy, and the big super volcano which is underneath. We don't know what will happen. That's why we have even projects dedicated to that. We are monitoring this area to see what is happening. If there is a subsidence, if there is an uplift, what is happening, we can just presume what is happening in the, in the magma chamber beneath. So this is another example of a volcano. It's, a, it's a Santorini. Again, we were able to derive this, kinds of, uh, this kind of displacement. This displacement here are related always to this point here, so it's a relative. So, um, can, okay, uh, this is... Um, so over Europe, Sentinel-1 data are acquired with this frequency that I said, uh, six days. Uh, it's for Europe, but uh, for other areas, of course, it's globally, but not with such a big frequency. But there are areas in the world, these uh, volcanic areas, where we, are, um, we have higher frequency, just to have more data to, to see what's going on there. So for example, the super volcanoes, we have also Yellowstone, in Japan, in Israel, uh, there the data are obtained a bit more frequent, uh, on a more frequent basis. So it's here you see this um, red is where we have six days coverage. Then these uh, small triangles here are these uh, this special volcanic areas that we are monitoring. And we have here also uh, quite, night, quite nice frequency of acquisitions. So these uh, things, are this data, are, as I said, it's not experimental anymore. It's something that is used by, um, by the institutes all over the world, in Europe, uh, who receive this data and process, and they constantly assimilate to their, uh, to their uh, models, just to understand better uh, the, the dynamics of, of these processes. And we can, for example, forecast the eruption of, uh, of uh, volcanoes or uh, foresee some uh, seismic events. There are also another, other methods. A lot of writing, I don't like it, but um, there are also other methods. So not only uh, satellites uh, observing the Earth, but also techniques like uh, uh, SLR, or VL, VLBI, so satellite laser ranging and very long baseline interferometry, uh, which are uh, helping us to understand uh, also displacement on the global scale uh, to see, to, to, yeah, on the global scale. So for example, SL, uh, SLR, so satellite laser ranging, is based on the global network of observation uh, stations. Uh, which are measuring this uh, round trip time of ultra short uh, light pulses from this um, from the sorry uh, retro reflectors on board satellites to the ground okay so this is one one technology and we can have these accurate measurements of the motion of motion um, up to millimeters per year so we are but still we are doing this point wise so we are only doing these measurements we can derive these measurements for the station. Then there is a VLBI, so it's not based on satellite data, but on the uh, array of radio telescopes. We have, so we have an uh, array of radio telescopes on the Earth, and we are simultaneously collecting data from 
different radio uh, radio sources in the sky, so like quasars, for example. And uh, through this uh, method, we can also obtain the uh, the the position of these um, of these stations of these telescopes. Okay, so just. Uh, just a short, uh, small image to show you how it works. So you, here you have the quasars, and here you have the radio telescopes. So um, this is what we are using currently, um, and this is for the current situation. Uh, here, my colleague was talking about the future, but what about the past? We didn't have uh, satellite images in the past. But maybe satellite images can help us also to see something what happened in the past. So there is a nice example of the, um, uh, how using space-based uh, methods, we can um, derive some information about the impact craters. Impact craters are those craters after the meteorite uh, hit. So for example, there is this mission that I mentioned before, Goche, the gravity mission. And they are, they are measuring gravity gradients uh, and we can, using this uh, gravity gradients, we can characterize better the lithosphere and we can reveal relics of ancient continents, for example, under Antarctica. There is one project of ESA that we had uh, with these nice results, so you can um, see this video later on. There is another mission, magnetic mission SWARM. Uh, now it's just two years of the mission but we are already able to investigate the relationship between the ionospheric magnetic field perturbation and the earthquakes and earthquakes worldwide. So this um, seismic active regions on Earth, uh, which are identified from the magnetic fields measurements, are those red, okay? And they are basically uh, covering the areas that we already know that they are, they are um, active. So you see that not only from the Earth observation, but also other, um, other missions, not only SAR missions, but also other missions, we can obtain very nice and useful information. So, okay, this is just uh, this impact craters again. So they discovered from this magnetic uh, mission swarm and gotcha, gravity, they discovered some anomalies. And these anomalies basically are where we already know, we have some information that there are these impact craters. So this is also something, this is new area, it's, uh, it's still new, to study the, the past, to see what could happen uh, in the past. I don't know, okay, there are, again, other examples of these anomalies. So you see here, this is also from altimetric data. Okay, and this is the impact crater that we know. Um, so we can observe this one, we know for sure, and we observe the same uh, anomalies in gravity and uh, magnetic field over these areas and also other areas. So now this is the, 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 there are the new studies to see where these impact craters we can find in other places. Again, magnetic anomaly. So it's the, another examples. Okay, so the summary is that uh, for sure we are, um, we are in the very nice phase of changes. We are really living in a great uh, period and the, the, this rapidly evolving uh, earth observation and GNSS and also other technologies are helping us uh, to understand the past and also the future, which is very important. Um, there are data and techniques uh, in Earth observation, which are relevant for plate tectonics, as I show you. Um, there is also a potential for growing accuracy, uh, density of the measurements and, and other information. We have data and software tools which are freely available, which 10 years ago was not possible. Uh, now we have all of these uh, things. So what we need now is uh, good students, good teachers and good students who will process the data for us in the future and who will take the lead uh, to discover all these very interesting things. Thank you very much.